You guys doing good this morning? How amazing was worship this morning? I just want to say, come on. I, I mean, we, we really um, have amazing worship leaders here. I'm not just, because <laughs> I'm the worship pastor. I'm not just saying that because I'm in charge of the whole thing. But uh, there was something special on worship this morning. Did you guys feel that? I, I was in the back, and I was just like, I am a child of God. <laughs> yes, I am. It's, what's really interesting about the gospel and, and the power of the Holy Spirit is that you can know things your whole life. I've known I'm a child of God my whole life, but then when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and just goes, boom, and then you believe it as if it was the first time you've ever heard that in your whole life, that's what God was doing with me this morning. was like, yes, I believe it this morning. Um, I want to, uh, just before I jump into the sermon this morning, um, have any of you been following what's happening? At the, I guess they're calling it the Asbury Renewal or Revival or Awakening or anything like that. Um, raise your hand if you've been if you heard about that. Okay, so if you haven't heard about this, I want you to go on YouTube uh, and I want you to type in Asbury Revival. I, that'll probably do it for you. Twenty twenty two or twenty twenty three, and uh, <laughs> and there is something really, I don't know what the right maybe precious. Uh, that's happening at this university uh, on the mainland where God has just been coming and meeting with these university students and where worship has just not stopped for how long has it been? A couple of weeks? Nine days. Nine days where um, every night they've been meeting and there's just been, there's been signs, wonders, miracles. But more than that, it's young people are getting their identities in Christ and they're repent and there's a spirit of repentance and it just... As I was in the back here worshiping, I was like, oh, God, do it here. That was my heart. It was just like, God, do it here. Um, we, we actually had a – worship was really touching me this morning. Um, we had a meeting with our staff, and uh, what we are intentionally doing in worship – this is very intentional – is I've, I've told my worship leaders, I want you to linger in the spirit just a little bit and a little bit more, and a little bit more every week, because I think our hearts as leadership for the church here is that we want to create a place where the Holy Spirit feels welcome. Do you guys, do you guys want that? And so, as just so you're aware, as, as the next coming weeks come along, we're going to be lingering more in worship. We're going to be asking the Holy Spirit to meet us and encounter us. And, and uh, I think just this morning was just a taste of just, just lingering in his presence and seeing what Holy Spirit wants to do. Maybe we go all, all morning in worship and we don't have a sermon. I don't know. Um, we're going to plan on keeping the plan. But if Holy Spirit changes things, then we will, we will shift the plan. Okay. So, um, I am excited to be with you guys. I have been uh, uh, studying the book of Galatians. We are in... Uh, we're in a series in the book of Galatians. This series has been amazing. Uh, Ryan's sermon last week, I thought was one of his best sermons he's ever preached. It was fire. It was amazing. And so I'm kind of coming on the tail end of that. We're going to be continuing to talk about the book of Galatians. Uh, let me give a little overview, and then we're going to talk about the law, okay? So Paul starts off uh, with this letter to the Galatians, the Galatians church. And basically what Paul is doing is he says, I hear that there's these people coming to you. And these people are called the Judaizers. Judaizers. Thank you. Uh, and they're coming to the church, and they're saying that you need to be circumcised in order to be righteous before the Lord. You need to follow all the laws in order to be righteous before the Lord. In order to be saved, you need to follow the law. And then Paul literally loses his mind. He goes on a rant. He, he in modern days, he would be triggered, okay? <laughs> Paul is triggered, and he's just like, what? And he's like, you foolish Galatians, why are you listening to? This makes no sense to me. Do you know? And he, he brings up all of these scripture verses of the Old Testament. He brings up Abraham. He says, was Abraham justified by the law? Was Abraham? No, Abraham was justified by his faith in believing the promises of God. And nothing has changed. The, the law does not make you righteous before, the God, before God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God is what the New Testament says. And he just, he just goes on this rant. And the rant is not only refuting the power of the law, 
but it's elevating the power of grace. That we are saved by faith in Christ and by his grace, his free gift of grace that he gives to each and every one of us. That, that it's not by our works that we should boast, but by his grace that he lavishly pours out on us that we are called sons and daughters of God. So we are... Um, so he brings up this Abrahamic covenant. Um, Abraham covenant includes four promises, land, many descendants, great nations, and that all will be blessed. Uh, Genesis 12, this is really interesting. Genesis 12 says, uh, God says five times to Abraham, I will, five times, I will do this. I will make your nation a great nation. I will give you many descendants. The promise to Abraham was an unconditional promise. The, the covenant given to Abraham was an unconditional covenant as opposed to the covenant of the laws that were given on Mount Sinai with Moses. This is what Paul is comparing the two covenants. Moses was a conditional law. It is thou shalt, thou shalt. And you have the Ten Commandments of thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Thou shalt not murder. And you have the Ten Commandments. Um, and he, he, he likens, he's trying to understand <laughs> he's trying to get the Galatians to say, no, circumcision is not the sign of the covenant. Uh, it, no, he's saying it's not a prerequisite of the covenant. He's saying it's just a sign of the covenant. Not a prerequisite, but just a sign. And <laughs> I was trying to think of an illustration to, um, to try and explain this, because I think culturally we're just, we don't quite understand what's, what Paul is trying to say here and why circumcision is such a big deal. So I'm going to give a really cheesy example here of our culturally in Kona that we might understand. Okay. So uh, a few years back during the whole COVID season, um, I had this, I don't know, this idea of how to make some extra cash on the side, this little side hustle kind of deal. And so uh, Turo was really big. Anybody know what Turo is? You rent a car. So I, I, bought a, I bought a brand new Jeep Gladiator. It's the, um, uh, zero down, all on credit. And I was like freaking out, like, oh my gosh. But then I did the math. I was like, no, I can do this. I can, I'm going to make some money on this. But I was really nervous because this is a big purchase. So I get this Jeep Gladiator and I'm driving it around in town. I pull up to Banyan Surf, which I surf all the time. I know all the guys there. And I pull up, and one of my friends pulls up to me, and he goes, hey, you cannot park here. And, and I, I roll down the window. I'm like, bro, it's me. And he goes, why are you driving a Jeep? <laughs> I'm like, it's my rental. I bought it. It's my rental car. He's like, what? Why are you driving a Jeep? And then, and then I'm with my son Malachi at Pine Trees, and we're going to go surf. I pull up in the Jeep Gladiator truck, and this, this guy pulls up to me, who I don't know, and, he, and uh, he goes, can I surf here? <laughs> and, and I go, what? He goes, you guys cannot surf here. You go, go home, go home, Hollies. And I'm like, what? And my son, my son was quarterback of Kealakehe football team at the time. And he's like, what? I'm born and raised here. I quarterback Kealakehe football team. Ah! And he starts going off. And then I'm like, I'm born and raised here in Hawaii too. What are you talking about? <laughs> and then he goes, why are you driving a Jeep? <laughs> so, it, what would happen if I pulled up to Banyans in a lifted Tacoma? What if I pull up to, to Pine Trees in a, in a lifted, you know, F-150? It's, it's not a prerequisite to have a lifted truck to be a local. But it's a sign, okay? It definitely helps. So, what Paul is trying to say is it's not a prerequisite to be circumcised, but it helps. Okay? <laughs> All right. We are justified by faith. It's faith that we are justified by the free gift of grace that God lavishes out on us. Another illustration is... I'm going to let you a little into our family. I have laws in my family, okay? Do you have laws in your family? I, I got laws in my family. Number one law in the layman household is do not talk to dad in the morning <laughs> because dad's grumpy in the morning and he loves you. 
but he, he won't express that love in, a, <laughs> in the morning because he's grumpy. He needs two cups of coffee, and then you talk to dad, okay? Uh, we have a few other uh, laws in our house. Uh, let's see. Second, uh, everyone do their chores, right? Specifically, Zane is weed whacking. Rhea is dishes. Evie is vacuuming, okay? Um, don't leave your clothes on the floor of the bathroom. Amen. Uh, do put the top of the toothpaste back on the toothpaste <laughs> tube. Okay, that is, that's my wife's law. Okay. <laughs> Uh, no, this is for girl. I got two girls, so no screaming unless someone's dying or an ambulance needs to be called. <laughs> uh, and, and be nice, be kind, uh, and flush the toilet for God's sake. <laughs> okay. So these are a few laws in my house that, you know, I, I want them to be followed, but how many of you know my kids, do they follow all of these laws all the time? N no. No, they do not. <laughs> <laughs> that was a hypothetical question. So, no, they don't. And, um, but, are they still my children? Is there anything they can do or not do to be disowned from the family? No. They will always be my child. There is n the, the laws in my household do not determine that they are my children. They are my children because they're my children. They are my blood. And if they've been adopted, some of you have adopted children, they are your children because you've adopted them legally into your family. There is nothing that can take us away from being sons and daughters of God. On the other hand, if you come to my house and you follow 100% of these rules, you clean up after yourself, you do all the chores, you flush the toilet, you do all the things, will you be my son or daughter? Does that give you entry into my family? No. You have to be adopted. You have to be adopted into my family. This is what Paul is saying. This is what Paul is saying, that why the law is powerless. So, Paul has such a high view of grace. What does, there has to be some questions that we start asking. Okay, okay so then what is the purpose of the law? What, why is the law written down? What, like, do we need to even follow the law? And I think if you're asking that question, you're asking the right question. Because if you're asking the question that says, do we even need the law? It means you have a high understanding of grace. You have Paul's understanding of grace. Now, Paul goes on in the, in, well, as we're going to see, and in chapter 5, and he talks about how, no, no, do we, do we sin more so that grace more abounds? No, that's foolishness. No, we receive the grace of God. We're adopted into his son, as sons and daughters um, of God, and we want to please our Father. God changes our hearts. The law cannot change our hearts. Only the Spirit of God can. All right, so... Paul explains this in Galatians 3, uh, 21 to 25. Galatians 3, 21. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? No, absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would, righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until, faith, until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian, that's a key word, our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Not that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. And that's it. Okay. So. In the first century, uh, there were many wealthy families that would have had a guardian or a tutor who would take care of their child before they would come of age where they could be right inherit, they could inherit the, uh, they would come of age and then they would step into the inheritance. So they would have a tutor or a guardian that would protect them, make sure they don't do anything bad, but actually um, would actually be carrying a rod around to discipline the child so that he wouldn't do any, that he would stay in his lane, that he would not 
he would basically not do something so stupid that he dies and he doesn't get to inherit to pr the promise. So basically you had this tutor that would follow around the, the wealthy child and just keep him, keep him safe, but through punishment. Paul uses this example um, of what the, law, what the law does for us. Now, um, it's really interesting. Paul in Corinthians, he comes to the Corinthians church and he says, did I come to you with a rod and a staff? No, I came to you as a father. So throughout Paul's teaching, he's connecting the dots between this. Did I come to punish you? No, I came as a father. And he's trying to connect these dots with all the churches that he's speaking to. So how do we relate to the law as Christians, as followers of Christ, as those who are saved by, by, by the grace of God through faith in Jesus? I want to give you three ways um, that, we <clears throat> that we participate in the law. Number one, the law is a curb. The law is a curb. So the law keeps us out of trouble. Uh, we obey because we're scared of punishment. The law, if you break the law, there's going to be consequences of the law, right? right? So the law keeps, it's a curb to keep you, you ever curbed your wheel on when you're making a turn too tight? And it's just like, oh, well, the law is like that. It keeps you on the right track. It shows you where the, the road is that you, that you don't wander and go off-roading and pop your tires and do all that stuff, okay? So we obey, we obey because it keeps us out of trouble. Second, the law is a mirror. The law is a mirror. The law shows us that we need Jesus, shows us our sinful desires compared to God's perfection. So, for instance, let's take a few Ten Commandments. Commandment number six, thou shalt not kill. It shows me that I'm supposed to be aware of God's kindness to me, that I wouldn't dare think hateful thoughts to others. So all it does, all the law is doing in the Ten Commandments, it's highlighting that we need a Savior. We need a Savior. Uh, commandment uh, number nine, for example, thou shalt not lie. It shows me that I'm supposed to love honesty. I'm supposed to love being honest so much that I'm never tempted to lie, even when twisting the truth would gain me an advantage or get me out of a bad situation. So it's sh I want to love truth. Commandment number 10, thou shalt not covet, shows me that I'm supposed to to be so satisfied with God and so trusting of his plan for me that I don't get jealous when someone else has something that I want. It shows me that I, that I need to trust God more. Martin Luther has this uh, really great quote I, I found uh, this week. He says, the law made me hate God. The more the law showed me what I should be, the more I realized how much I wasn't. And it was really interesting as I was studying this passage and, and, and pouring into this, this sermon, I actually kind of felt like, like Martin Luther. I was like, I hate the law. The law is making me feel so bad. But I think, that's, I think that's what Martin Luther is saying that we should be having. It's as I was studying this and preparing for this sermon, my need for Jesus became so much more evident every single day. I need a savior. I need Jesus. I need someone to set me free from the law of sin and death. I need grace in my life. So, the law shows us that we need a savior. Uh, the law is also, and then last, uh, first, the law is a, a curb, second, the law is a mirror, third, the law is a compass. When we get saved and are adopted into the family of God, our hearts are changed and we want to please our heavenly father because of the love that God has poured out in our hearts. So the law helps us love God better because it shows us what he is like. The law shows us the nature and character of God, that he is a loving, kind father that he is not jealous, that he is perfectly satisfied within himself, that he is kind to us, that he is truthful. He's not a liar. 
the, the law shows us and points us and is a compass to show us the nature and character of God. And as we're adopted into his family, like I want, I don't know about you, but I want to be like my father. I want to be like the one who has saved me. But God's purpose was not just to redeem us from sin, but also to adopt us into his family. Chapter uh, 4, Galatians 4, 3 through 7 says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who, who calls out Abba, Father, or Daddy. You are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also his heir. So what does it mean to be a slave to sin? What is he talking about? Um, there was a time in my life when I was a teenager where I was a slave to sin, where I, I would wake up every morning thinking about how I could break the law. <laughs> There was time when I was a teenager, I would wake up and I would anticipate the party and what I was going to do at that party that night. And it consumed every single thought that I had. It consumed everything in my life. And I was a slave to my desires for sin. This is what Paul is talking about. At one time, you were a slave to your sin. And that's what you, you craved to sin more. You craved to go to that party. You craved to, to, uh, to give in to the lust of the flesh and the desires of the flesh. But now that you're adopted as sons and daughters through grace and your faith in Jesus, now Jesus himself and the, by the power of the Holy Spirit has changed your heart so that you're no longer a slave to those desires. But your desire has changed where you want to obey your father. This is something that the law cannot do. The law can never change our hearts, and that's why we need a Savior. It's only by the power of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, that, we, that our hearts are changed and, and our desires are changed. Our deepest desires of our hearts as believers change. It's one of the signs, actually, that you are a true believer of Jesus and you have put your faith in him, is that the desires of your heart change. You're not perfect in those desires. <laughs> I'm not perfect in those desires, but I do. I, in my inmost being, I want to please my father. The law shows us that we need a savior. The grace of God enables us to cry out, Abba, Father. I'm no longer a slave, but I'm a son. I want to be like my father, and the spirit of God has changed my heart's desires. It's a free gift, but it's a gift that has to be accepted. If, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus this morning, if you haven't fully surrendered, meaning, and what I mean by this is, my life is dependent that Jesus is telling the truth. I have thrown my life on the altar of the cross. And if the cross is nothing, then my life is nothing. If this whole thing is fake, my whole life is a complete waste of time. That's what it means to put faith in Jesus. I have stepped off the cliff and fully put my hope and my faith in the finished work of the cross. And by doing so, I receive this free gift of grace, knowing that I am a son and daughter, son of God, and that I am an heir to the promise. So it's a free gift, but it's a gift that has to be accepted. The imagery is like God has this gift on Christmas and he's trying to give it to you and you're like, oh, I'm good, I'm good, I'm just going to, I'm going to go buy my own present. Right. 
If you haven't put your faith in Jesus, I want to give you that invitation this morning. And I'm not going to call you to the front, but just in your seats right now, you can just do that. You can say, ah, God, I want to put my faith in you. I'm tired of living on the law. I'm, trying to, I'm tired of just thinking that I can be righteous before him because of my own works, because I'm a good person. The Bible says none of us are good people. And all it takes is just taking that step of faith and just putting our hope and our trust in Jesus. And we're adopted into his family. And there's so much joy that comes from it. You are set free. Like that song that we sang this morning, I am no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You can sing that song with joy as you put your faith in Jesus. So God, we thank you so much for the finished work of the cross this morning. I thank you that this is a free gift of grace that you give to us. I thank you, God, that you have given us. I ask for a new faith this morning, God, a faith to fully surrender and to throw our lives at the altar of the cross, God, this morning. The law shows us that we need Jesus. The law shows us that we need a Savior. And I'm so grateful that we're, so, we're set free, God. Thank you, God, for the power of your grace in our life. In the name of Jesus. Amen.